over these next couple of Sundays, we expect that we'll be pretty crowded probably for parking. And I just want to share with you that we do have permission to park at the bank across the street and at the strip mall uh, beyond 7-Eleven. And so if you're young, especially, or young at heart, that would be appreciated. You could help us out there a little bit over these next couple Sundays. <clears throat> Many people ask the question, what's going to happen to this world? We think about things like global warming, uh, probably untrue, but it's still a major issue for many people. Global terrorism, we think of warfare and, and diseases that ravage the earth as men try to find solutions for those things, murders and thefts and famine and, and sorceries, and you could go on and on with all the kinds of things that are happening. It seems like our culture today is filled with anger and rancor. People are not able to get along. They're not able to have difference of opinion without there being uh, strong emotional feelings. And so the question raised often in the minds of many people, what's going to happen? It seems in some ways that it's a little bit like the days of Noah when the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every thought of the heart was only evil continually and he was sorry that he had made man it seems in some ways that we are approaching that level today it's difficult for us to judge of course we're a part of it we're inside of it all and so we don't look at it quite the same way that he does but it still raises a question for many people what's going to happen to this earth as we move through our study of revelation we find ourselves now in chapter 20 and we're dealing with the positive things that are going to take place on this earth. And so it's exciting for us to look at what's going to happen. We saw last time that the king is coming, that Jesus is returning. He's coming to set up his kingdom here on this earth. And as was said this morning, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, and with it he will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And so as we encounter this passage of Scripture this morning, we're really talking about what the Old Testament referred to as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of David, and which has been given the name, post the book of Revelation, millennial kingdom. In the Old Testament, there was no indication as to the exact length of this, except that in the book of Daniel, we're told that this kingdom that the one like the Son of Man would receive was um, an eternal kingdom. Now, in the book of Revelation, as John records for us the words from Jesus, we find that the phrase 1,000 years is used six times. And there's nothing in the text that would indicate that there's anything less than or that it's not a literal 1,000 years. In all fairness, there are many who understand the 1,000 years to be figurative and who do not see it as a literal earthly kingdom of Jesus here that is established for the Jewish people. But it seems to me if you read the book of Revelation in a chronological fashion as we are, if you read it in a straightforward fashion, then you come to the logical conclusion that there is a 1,000-year kingdom even as we read in the text this morning. Three things that I, that I think we need to see about this kingdom two of which are highlighted and, and promoted in this passage, and one we bring from the Old Testament with us. The first is we see that there will be a sequestration of evil. To sequester something means to, to lock it off somewhere, to, to hide it or to remove it from public access. And what we see in the text is an angel coming down from heaven and he is going to put the evil one in this prison. Now, God has authority over Satan and can limit him at will. We find that in several places in the scriptures. You remember the story of Job. When Job wants to attack, Satan rather, wants to attack Job. And God says, you can do this, but you can't go any further. And then he says, okay, now you could do this, but you can't go any further. And so God has the authority over the evil one. And he restricts the degree 
of, to which Job can be tried by the evil one. We find that Satan is allowed to sift God's saints. In Luke chapter 22, right after the Lord's Supper, the evening that Jesus was headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And so Satan has on occasion the authority to sift us, to shake up our lives, and to try to disrupt things. We find the scriptures teach us that Satan is allowed to enter unbelievers. He enters into Judas, the Bible tells us, on that same evening. As Judas was preparing to betray Jesus, Satan entered into him, and off we go with that chain of events. And we find the scriptures teach us that Satan is also allowed to, to control believers. Specifically, we're told that Ananias was filled by Satan when he lied to Peter in the presence of the church leaders. Peter himself, when he responded to Jesus and said, you're not going to go to the cross, you're not going to suffer, was influenced or controlled by Satan. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. And so Satan has the opportunity to interact with individuals, but God has the control. God has limits that are placed upon him. And what we see in this text is that Satan is con currently deceiving the world around us. What we find is that he is a liar from the beginning. And so it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3, he comes to Adam and Eve, as you know, and he approaches Eve and he says to her, you will not surely die. And Eve embraced that thought and decided that she would take of the fruit. She ate it. She also gave it to Adam, and together they ate. And so from the very beginning, he is a liar. And Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 44, that he is the father of all lies. So anytime a person tells a lie, we want to categorize them. We want to say, well, there are terrible lies and there are white lies and there are other types of things. But anytime somebody tells a lie, that individual is functioning under the leadership, perhaps influence, or maybe even the control of the evil one because he is the father of lies and the father of all liars. And Jesus recognizes that. In 1 John, the same writer who's writing to us the book of Revelation tells us at the end of the chapter that the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. He uses an expression there that gives us the picture of a mother or a grandmother sitting in a rocking chair with a baby in her arms. And he says that the world is in the lap of the evil one that Satan has authority over this world. He has authority over the realm in which we live. And he is engaged in constant deception. The things that we see happening in the political arena, the things that we see happening in our communities around us, are often the result of this deception. People are, are being deceived. They sometimes think they're doing well, Sometimes not, but many times they think they're doing well. They think they're, they're headed in the right direction, but they're being deceived and they're living a lie. And we see that kind of thing happening in the media all around us all the time. And so this world is being deceived by the evil one. But the day is coming, John tells us here, when this evil one will be sequestered. He will be locked away for a thousand years. He is bound with chains. John says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. So he's wrapped in chains and he is sealed in the abyss. It says, and he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him. The abyss we met before, it's mentioned two other places in Scripture. It's mentioned back in the Gospel of Luke, 
when the demons who are confronted by Jesus beg him not to send them to the abyss. And then we saw it in Revelation chapter 9 when the, the fifth trumpet was sounded. We had someone being given the key to the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, we had these demons that came up. And there were millions of them that came up out of this abyss, this prison. And they afflicted the men on the earth. The abyss is the equivalent of Hades. It's the place where demons are incarcerated. And right now, for our benefit, God has locked away the vast majority of these fallen angels, these demons. And it's a good thing for us because the world would be far more evil than it is. They were released in this fifth trumpet and they afflicted the earth. Now Satan is being remanded to this place of incarceration. And so he's wrapped with a chain. He is placed in this abyss. It's closed over him. It's locked and it's sealed. And the purpose of all of this is so that he would not be able to deceive the earth or deceive the nations any longer throughout the duration of this thousand years. I've asked myself as I've studied this passage over the years, why it seems like this is redundant, the chains and the, and the locking in the abyss and so forth. It seems to me that what's, what's happening here is that the evil one is being remanded to this place of incarceration so that he would not be like a say a mob boss or someone who tries to run the crime syndicate right from prison itself he's not going to have any kind of impact on this earth he is limited by jesus from any of that and so he's going to be locked away and for a thousand years there will be something which has not been true since Genesis chapter 3 and that is there is no active deception to evil by the evil one by Satan himself and so God is going to bring about this age of a thousand years of peace it's a thousand years in which Jesus will reign and the earth will flourish without this deception without evil being perpetrated around us it's not saying there's no evil at all, but what's being communicated to us is that there is no one who actively deceives. There's no one who's going to uh, promote that and to um, push that agenda in our, in our uh, realm. The second thing this passage teaches us is the representation of holiness. In the next section, verses 4, 5, and 6, we have reference to resurrections that take place. And so that leads us into a discussion of who it is that will be living here on the earth. What role do the various people groups from the ages play in all of this? Jesus himself, we're told, is going to rule with a rod of iron. He is called in scripture the Holy One of Israel. And he is coming as the one who will reign over this earth. And so he will bring holiness to the forefront. The one who reigns as king will be righteous and holy. Secondly, we read in this passage that the martyrs who have, who have um, been coming into heaven during the course of this seven years of tribulation will be resurrected. The text says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on the forehead or their hand. So this is a specific statement with regard to those who have lost their lives during these last seven years. Those who have lived specifically in the last three and a half years under the reign of the Antichrist and who refused to receive that mark. These are the folks who are being resurrected here. We saw them earlier in the book of Revelation at different stages as the martyrs began to populate the earth. And now these individuals are resurrected in order to reign with Jesus. Thrones are established for them. They will sit on them. 
and they uh, are the ones who resisted the Antichrist, and they're raised to serve and to reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Now, not only the martyrs who come out of the tribulation period um, are, are going to be part of this, the statement is made by John here, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. And then he talks about another resurrection which is coming later, which we'll see next week in our study. But we have others who are involved here. And so what we find is as part of the first resurrection, we have Old Testament saints who are raised here as well. In Revelation 20, verse 5, we read, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is one who has a part in this first resurrection. The first resurrection includes all believers. And so there are stages to this first resurrection. The reason we say that this first resurrection includes all believers is because there's no evidence of a resurrection beyond this for believers. There's no evidence anywhere from this point on, from Revelation 20, verse 5 on, of believers being resurrected at any point. Secondly, we find that the Old Testament promised Daniel that he would be raised for his allotted portion. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, Daniel is told, seal up the book, Daniel, go your way, and you will enter into rest, and then you will be raised for your allotted portion in the kingdom. And so Daniel expected that he would be resurrected for this kingdom era. And the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, makes it clear that the resurrection of the Old Testament saints would occur after the tribulation. If you see it here in the text, it says, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. That's the same thing Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24 when he says there's going to be tribulation at that point when the, when the abomination of desolation occurs in the middle of the week. There's going to be tribulation that has never occurred in the world before. And so it's the same thing that Daniel was told. And he says, and at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. That's the woman who flies into the wilderness where she is nourished for the three and a half years. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So here we are now. Jesus has conquered all of the armies and the, and the martyrs out of the tribulation, the, the, the kingdom saints who've come out of the tribulation are resurrected. And at the same time, we have the resurrection of Old Testament all of the Jewish saints of the Old Testament. We have Abraham and Isaac. We have David. We have Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and all of those Old Testament saints who are resurrected to also participate in this kingdom of Jesus. There are three parts to, to this first resurrection, actually four parts three times. Part number one is Jesus here. He's the first fruits of the first resurrection. Part number two is the the rapture of the church when the church saints are resurrected they are part of the first resurrection the resurrection unto life and then over here we have the third part which is the tribulation saints and this chart doesn't show it but i would put in the old testament saints here as well based on daniel chapter 12. and so there are four major parts i've listed them for you here on this chart jesus the first fruits then the church saints at the rapture of the church, and then at where we are now in Revelation, we have the, the resurrection of the tribulation saints, the tribulation martyrs, those who died during this period, and the Old Testament saints. For those of you who are thinking way ahead here, there are a couple of anomalies in this whole process, Enoch and Elijah, who were, um, who were taken into heaven alive. We have some saints who came out of the tombs in Matthew 27, the moment that Jesus died. And we also have the two witnesses from Revelation chapter 11 who were resurrected shortly before this. So there are a couple of anomalies to this, but this is the first resurrection. 
the resurrection of believers. And so what we have as we enter the kingdom is, is all, all of the saints of God to this point in time who are present for this kingdom reign of Jesus. The New Testament saints, the bride, have come with Jesus. We, as the church, have come with Jesus as his bride. And so we have all of the others who are there as well. So that at this point, all believers of all ages are present for the kingdom. Secondly, there are no unbelievers present at the outset of the kingdom. The Bible tells us here that the Gentile kings and their armies are destroyed. It tells us that the remaining Gentiles are also destroyed. If you remember the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and following, we read these words. Uh, Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his glorious throne. The nations will be gathered. He will separate them, sheep and the goats, And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And so at this point in time, as Jesus is preparing the throne and and taking the throne of the kingdom for which God has prepared him, there will be no unbelievers present on the earth. When the rapture of the church occurs, at the outset of the tribulation, there are no believers left on the earth. But people start to become believers quickly, the 144,000 and many others. At the second coming of Jesus, when he judges the nations and the armies and the kings and all the unbelievers, he starts into the millennial kingdom, there are no unbelievers present on the earth. Over here, no believers present, although many become believers. Over here, no unbelievers present, Although those who are populating the kingdom, those who are physically living on the earth, will begin to have children. The, the, those who are physically living on the earth will be the woman, the nation of Israel, the one-third of Jewish people that have been protected by God, as well as the rest of her offspring from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and also we find that the surviving Gentile believers... Remember, sheep and goats. The sheep will be on the right, and the sheep will go into the kingdom which has been given to Jesus. The goats, the unbelieving Gentiles, will be destroyed. And so we have those who are physically alive on the earth at this point to, in, to inhabit or to populate the kingdom of God. Jesus comes to set up this kingdom, and it is populated strictly by believers at the very outset of this age. That's what's going to take place at this point. The third thing that we're able to gather, not from this passage, but John, John is a Jewish man, right? He is a son of Israel. He is an apostle and a disciple of Jesus. And so when he writes kingdom, There are many things that come to his mind as a reader of the Old Testament. And I want to share just some of them with us as we think about the kingdom that John is writing about that he does not go into detail with here. But he anticipates that you and I would do as he does, and that is we would build the picture from the Old Testament. First of all, the lifespan of man is increased to a thousand years. We read in Isaiah 65, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will be remembered no more. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad, my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping, the sound of crying. No longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days. All right, so no infant deaths. Or a man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of 100. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. Now, this is not the new heavens and the new earth of heaven and the eternal state, because there's still death here. 
There are people who will die. If a man dies at the age of 100, they're going to say, oh, poor child. So the age is going to be a lot longer at this point in time. And if death occurs, I take it, we're not told exactly, but I take it it occurs because somebody has rebelled against Jesus. Otherwise, people will live throughout the duration of the thousand years. See, in, in history, three times God has restricted the age of man. The first time in Genesis 3, when he went from indefinite to a thousand years. The second time in Genesis 6, when it went from a thousand years to 120 years. And the third time in Psalm 90, when Moses says uh, that our days are three score and ten, or if by reason of strength, four score. So we went to 80 years, 70 to 80 years. And that's where it sits. The lifespan of men and women, on average, is between 70 and 80 years. Sometimes it's worse because of living conditions. Sometimes it's slightly longer because of medicine or whatever. But the average is still right there. But what's going to happen during this period of time is that this is going to be reversed, and men will live throughout this age. I think it's fascinating to think about how the population of the kingdom is going to flourish. The first time when there were only believers on the earth, God started with two. Adam and Eve. The second time, when there were only believers on the earth, God started with eight. Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their wives. This time, when God starts with only believers on the earth, there are going to be thousands, perhaps even millions, of Jewish people and Gentiles who are believers, who are living on this earth, and their lifespan is going to go to a thousand years. Now think about it. The population charts are astronomical at this point. Death rate is basically zero. And the population explosion is going to be amazing. You ladies have a reproductive span of somewhere between age 15 and we'll say 40. All right, 25 years. That's one third of your life. If you're living in this period of time, one-third of your life is how long? About 330 years. And so you will be having baby, you won't, but the people who live there, you're relieved, I can tell from that, <laughs> will be having babies over a period of 300 years. But there won't be the complications with childbirth. There won't be the complications of all those kinds of things because God is going to restore the earth to near Edenic conditions. The entire earth is going to enjoy peace. In Isaiah 11, we read about the righteousness with which he will judge the poor, and he decides in fairness for the afflicted of the earth and so forth. He talks about the fact that the, the, the lion and the calf and the and the goat and the leopard will lie down together. And the young boy will play with them. The earth is going to be totally different at this point in time. Jesus is going to rule with a rod of, um, of iron. And the earth returns to near Edenic conditions. There are no carnivorous animals. They all go back to eating plants like they did before the, the sin of Adam and Eve. And so the whole topography of the earth has changed as everything is going to be different, as folks are going to live throughout this period of time and enjoy good health. The absence of disease, the absence of death is going to enable the earth's population to just, to just explode. Jesus' kingdom is going to be a glorious kingdom. And he reigns in righteousness and with peace and with joy and with rejoicing during this period of time. Now, all the people who live and who are born during this period of time will need to be reborn, just as people who are born today need to be reborn, and we'll read about that next week. But the earth is going to have this transition that will take place. There's a new heavens and new earth, he says. Behold, I created a new heavens and a new earth. It's not like this earth. Uh, there will be a number of things. It will be free of disease. Uh, the the uh, mountains and the oceans likely will be diminished and minimized. 
The mountains and the oceans were created at the flood to separate people, to keep them apart. Remember when we saw the judgments that took place earlier in the book of Revelation. One of them was that the mountains and the islands of the sea fled away. It's because the size of the oceans is reduced again. The mountains are reduced. And so mankind will be able to literally walk around the face of the earth, and you'll live long enough to do it. You live a thousand years, you can walk around the earth four or five times. You can explore all the countries of the earth. There'll be a, probably a temperate climate all over. And we won't have to worry about climate change. Jesus is going to fix it. All right? Uh, and, and so it's going to be very different. The curse of Genesis 3 is reversed. And, and so things will be very different on this coming earth as we encounter it here. Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the earth. Old Testament is very clear. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day the Lord will be the only one, his name the only one. And all the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin Gate and so forth. People will live in it. There will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. And so Jerusalem is going to be the capital where the Messiah, Jesus, the Jewish king, will reign over the throne of David for a thousand years. And the land of Israel will be divided among the 12 tribes. The book of Ezekiel lays this out. In Ezekiel, there are nine chapters devoted to describing the millennial temple and the arrangement of the tribes living around the temple and all the things that are going to take place that are promised to the nation of Israel. The land will be much larger than it is now because the oceans are reduced and the mountains are diminished and so on. All of these things take place as this, this kingdom is established by Jesus. And finally, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth for this thousand years. In Ezekiel 43, part of the description of the future days we read, then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east, and behold, the glory of the Lord was coming from the way of the east. And his voice was like the voice of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance which I saw at the beginning of the book. And so we have the earth that is overflowing with the glory of the Lord during that day. Very different from today. So here's the bottom line. God's glory through Jesus, brings a long-awaited utopian world. That which men have dreamed about for ages, which men know, intuitively we know, that God has intended for this to happen, but it won't happen because of the deceiver and the evil one, is going to take place. So, three things. Number one, though evil prevails, the king is coming. The king is coming. And he has authority over the evil one. Satan can do to you only what God permits, just like in Job, and only what you permit. I think you and I can say to Satan, as Jesus did, get behind me, Satan. So he can only accomplish the limits that God provides for him. To me, that's an encouragement for us, knowing that we live in an evil world. Secondly, the scripture says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. You are going to inherit the earth. And we're to be like Jesus, gentle. It doesn't mean pushover. It means someone who's smart enough to know that the evil agenda around us is not going to prevail. Smart enough to know when to allow God to manage things. Smart enough to know when to accept the hardship and the difficulties and so forth that we can't prevent. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. You've got a great inheritance coming, and so you need to enter into that. And thirdly, as we said a couple weeks ago, keep working on your wedding dress. Right? It's given to the bride to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clean, which is the righteous acts of the saints. You and I have a part in making that day 
even more glorious for Jesus. And so we look forward to that day. I hope that's an encouragement for you. You know, we come out of winter. We come out of hardship. Some of us are dealing with medical and personal issues and so forth. The evil one can only go as far as God lets him go or as you and I let him go. And so we can live in the victory that Jesus provides.